Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We've got an incredible show planned for you guys this evening. We are going to be talking about consciousness, psychedelics, namely LSD, the exploration of consciousness. Thank you so much for being here, especially if you're listening to this on the YouTube live version. So sit back, grab a drink, and enjoy this conversation. The Human Experience is in session. My name is Xavier Katana. My guest for this evening is Dr. Christopher Bosch. Dr. Bosch is a prof- prof- professor, researcher, and author who has been teaching and writing about consciousness, philosophy, and religion for more than 30 years. Christopher received his PhD in philosophy and religion from Brown University and went on to be a professor of religious studies at Youngstown Youngstown State University. Christopher has written a number of books, Life Cycles, Reincarnation, The Web of Life, and his latest is is LSD and the Mind of the Universe, Diamonds from Heaven, for the most part, which we'll be covering this evening. Chris, thank you so much for making the time. Welcome to HXP. Thank you, Xavier. Thank you for this conversation. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Chris, I mean, let's just let's start this off with, you know, how you got into this work. If if you want to kind of get into a little bit of your background, it's it's an I mean, would you say that's an unusual field to be in? <laughs> it certainly is. Uh, I was I come from a very classical mainstream background. I was raised in the Deep South. I went to Notre Dame and Cambridge and Brown University. I was a very standard classical mainstream education in religious studies. <clears throat> and shortly after I started my teaching career, right, this was back now, this is in 1978, I just, I was publishing some articles out of my dissertation. I was looking for where to take my research now that my dissertation was done. And I encountered the work of Stanislav Grof. Of course, the foremost authority in, on psych- integrating psychedelics into mm. psychotherapy. His book, Realms of the Human Unconscious, was an eye-opener for me, and in one reading, I felt like I had found my life's work. I thought that this work was extraordinarily important, not only for psychology, but very important for philosophy, understanding that psychedelics, in this case LSD, but in general psychedelics, function as amplifiers of consciousness. So they increase the sensitivity of our mind many times over for a short period of time. For an LSD session, it's about eight hours. And by amplifying consciousness, it gives us an opportunity to explore systematically the deeper dimensions of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we, so I, I saw this and I thought, this is tremendous. I've got to, I want to do this. But of course, Psychedelics had been made illegal in 1970 in this country. And so I had to make a difficult choice. What I decided to do was divide my life. And so I had what you might call a daytime job and a nighttime job. My daytime job, I was a professor of religious studies at Youngstown State University. I did the things that professors do. I lecture and uh, go to committee meetings and publish. And then I In my private life, I went into a very inner, hidden side of my life, and I began a rigorous process of using LSD, following Stanislav Grof's protocols, to explore my own consciousness. And then when the bottom dropped out of my own consciousness, I moved right into 
a larger field of consciousness so large that I think of it as the mind of the universe. Okay, and that's you know that's where we get into sort of the subtitle of your book, the the primary focus of your book. Um, you know, I, I really want to know: Did you at any point when you were beginning the research, did you feel as if you know that? I mean, this is this is very much taboo in our society. And did you feel at any point that your tenure would be threatened? Did you feel that you know your job would be threatened? Did you feel like coming out with this information would risk your career in any way? Uh, absolutely. I think that was a reasonable assertion. Uh, I knew that I was breaking the law in order to do this work. Uh, I knew that there would come a time, as there is now, that we would reclaim these important substances. Uh, but my entire, well, I knew that we would come back around to these substances, but I couldn't wait until we did. Hmm. Um, I knew that if I if this became public knowledge, if I was too public about this, I would probably lose my job. And, and I love teaching. I love being with the students in the classroom. I love being an academic. And so I just uh, kept this work private. Uh, my you know, close colleagues in the department knew, but I kept it private. I'd never talked to my students about it. I did not become in any way a public figure. I mean, this was between, I did 73 high dose LSD sessions following Stanislav Grof's protocol for high dose psychedelic sessions mm -hmm. between 1979 and 1999. Okay. So this is, this is a, between when I was 30 and 50 and I'm 70 now. So this book, I've spent 20 years integrating and digesting these experiences before producing this book. Hmm. Okay, I mean that's that's quite a, a range of time and a tremendous amount of sessions to to have with this compound. Was there a reason that you selected LSD, you know, namely specifically? Why not another substance? Why not DMT, psilocybin? Why not ayahuasca? Well, you have to go back to 1978 and think about the landscape. Then ayahuasca was. This was before the era of ayahuasca, psilocybin mushrooms were around. It was really before the era of DMT. But more importantly, um, my work really was founded on Stanislav Grof's work. And most of Stan's work, his early work, was basically done with LSD. And I trusted what I saw in his uh, in his research. Mm -hmm. So basically, I chose to work with the, with his with this substance, LSD. After I stopped my sessions, I've had experiences with other psychedelics, you know, psilocybin, DMT, and ayahuasca. But my pri what I consider my primary work, the core work that's the subject of my philosophical reflections, are these 73 LSD sessions. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I find it intriguing because I think Congress passed, you know, into law that, you know, banning LSD, I think that went into effect. 1967, right? Yeah. Well, there were a series of laws, basically 67, 69, 70, basically is a nice, convenient, easy date for that was the Controlled Substances Act that was passed. Okay. And I mean, there in your book, you talk about certain synchronicities that started to happen in your world. Can you talk a little bit about that, that encouraged you to carry out these experiments? Because even though you did them in secret, I mean, did you... Did you have did you have a plan that you were going to release this sort of book later? Uh, I always assumed that there would come a time, and this became a stronger conviction if the work continued, that there would come a time when I would bring this work forward to the world. But I knew that it could not be while I was an academic, and I it could not be while I was still subject to the statute of limitations for this work. Mm. So it was only after I retired from the university and after I was past the statute of, limit of, yeah. for, of limitations that I felt comfortable speaking about this Makes work. sense. But in the work itself, I always sort of saw myself one way or another, sooner or later, um, finding a way to bring the core content of these sessions um, to others. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a philosopher. I'm, I was trained to ask large questions. 
I was trained. I really wanted to answer the type, ask the type of questions that, you know, we, that keeps us up late at night when we're thinking about the meaning of existence, and the purpose of things, or whether there is a purpose of things, and is there an intelligence operating deep in this superstructure and substructure of the universe? Hmm. And this was an opportunity to explore those questions on an experiential basis. And I became quickly convinced in this work that the most important contributions to my field in the near future, which was philosophy of religion, would be done by people who were working not out of a theoretical basis, but they would be working out of an experiential basis. Sure. And so I'm not sure if you, you answered my question regarding the synchronicities, if you could just touch on that. Well, that, <laughs> that kind of jumps ahead in the storyline a bit. Okay. Uh, I, it wasn't, I did not... I was not aware of any particular synchronicities going into the work, but if I, I'll just tag this and maybe we'll come sure. back around to it later. Okay. okay. As my work deepened over the course of those 20 years, even though my students never knew I was doing this work, I found that some of my students were being activated in their own personal lives by my psychedelic work. There was a spillover. Hmm. Of, of consciousness transformation that began in my sessions. But because consciousness is not a private phenomenon, because consciousness is in, essentially the deeper levels of consciousness are boundarylessness. They're, they're boundaryless. Okay. Um, the impact of my sessions began to unroll beyond my personal life. And that's, that led me to do, do some serious thinking and research on how to continue to do my work while also taking care of my students and continuing my work as a professor. Having and that a normal led to life. Writing the, having a normal life. And that led to writing the book, The Living Classroom, which is about fields of consciousness in group settings. And in that book, I don't even mention psychedelics because the issue is not psychedelics. The issue is the nature of consciousness. And what happens when people come together and focus their intention in sustained exercises for periods of months and years? I love that. I love that. I'm feeling this resonance in your words, which I'm really enjoying. So, I mean, we mentioned that these compounds amplify consciousness in a way you said your words. So, you know, I want to know what were the, some of the questions that you were asking yourself? What were the questions that you <clears throat> wanted answers to? Well, I got into this, again, we're thinking the late 70s, because I was interested in enlightenment, and I had been meditating for a number of years, and I had encountered the kind of blocks that people typically encounter in the early years of sitting practice. And I thought that if I could do some sessions and engage my unconscious and confront whatever blocks were waiting for me in my unconscious, it would basically speed the process of my own spiritual realization. Um, that model of individual transformation is a model that was shattered along the way in this work, because within three years I was getting drawn into vast, intense purification processes that involved thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. I got into a whole series of experiences for years that were just far too large and far too intense to understand them in terms of some type of healing or clarification or realization of one's personal transformation. I began to understand that in these deep, deep, highly, highly energized states of consciousness, if you focus in them in a very specific way, you actually can begin to impact or heal some portion of the collective unconscious. Okay, okay, please continue. Well, let me back up and, and a little bit about method. Uh, Stan Groff clearly distinguishes between low-dose psycholytic therapy and high-dose psychedelic therapy. Low-dose psycholytic therapy, usually 50, 200 micrograms, is a process of peeling the unconscious layer by layer, uh, multiple sessions, gradually unfolding the unconscious and helping heal whatever 
issues are lurking in the unconscious. Psychedelic high dose therapy is very different. <clears throat> it in the early years in the Spring Grove Hospital, the agenda was to try working with a patient population of people who had cancer or had terminal illness. They were not they were not trying to heal them. These people were going to die. They basically were trying to blast through all the layers of the personal unconscious and trigger an experience of an encounter with the universe that would give them some kind of glimpse of where they were going when they died. They mm -hmm. basically were trying to trigger a near-death episode experience wow. in these subjects. It was a very interesting and a, and a very successful project. So I came along later and I thought, well, if, if LSD can be used in high, oh, their protocol was limited to three sessions, no more than three sessions. Okay. So I thought if you can do it safely three times, and you can do it safely more times. So I chose, partly for matters of efficiency, a number of different things I discuss in the book, but I chose to work after about three sessions to work with very high doses of LSD, and I worked at 500 to 600 micrograms wow. consistently for those 20 years. Now, the state of arousal, the state of amplification when you're working with doses of LSD that high, plus when you completely internalize the experience. So let me back up for a minute. Mm -hmm. We're talking about sessions. We're not talking about tripping. Never gone to a concert on acid. You know, <laughs> never stayed up all night talking with my friends. Okay. In the days when I did these sessions, I was totally isolated from the world. I was working with a sitter who kept took care of me. Right. I was lying down with eye shades and earphones, a very, very carefully curated playlist and what you do is when, you're, when your consciousness becomes hyper-amplified like this, if you focus it internally, if you really create conditions where you do not engage the world, but you engage just your mind, a series of things began to percolate and you confront deeper and deeper levels of your consciousness. Okay? When you are working with very high doses of LSD like this, eventually, in a relatively short period of time after 10 or 15 sessions you're just blowing your consciousness far far out mm -hmm. uh, into the universe and then slowly gathering it back in at the end of the day and then making a detailed record of your experience within 24 hours that's the method to open up consciousness experience the universe as cleanly or experience whatever it is as cleanly and clearly as you can with no distortions and no complications, come back and then write it down and then analyze your experience, keep track of your experience. And if you do this, basically uh, there is a conversation that takes place with the universe or a deepening communion that takes place with the universe. You are initiated systematically, step by step, into a deeper experience, not only of your own mind, but into this larger mind, which is the context and surround mind, uh, which underpins your mind. Okay. Okay. So this was just to just to restate what you just mentioned yeah. was you, know, you established this protocol for yourself, a, a therapeutic pro protocol to engage high, extremely high doses of LSD, and in you purposely set up ways where you would disconnect as much as possible from contact with the outside world civilization to better understand these questions you were asking or better understand the information that you were receiving studying well, the universe I wanted, to understand, I wanted to understand my own consciousness and through that to understand the nature of reality itself Stan's early work gave me evidence that one could have not only knowledge of one's own unconscious, but you can have knowledge of the mind of the universe or the mind of the cosmos, or some would say the mind of God. So I was interested in learning as much about the universe as I could, and I also wanted to know the truth about my own being. What was my being? Because I was a you know, professor of religious studies, and because I taught courses in comparative mysticism, I, I knew about the spiritual traditions of the world. I knew what the cosmologies were of our deepest mystical traditions. Uh, 
And I sort of, I kept that all on the maybe table and I just set out to see what I could learn using this protocol. So, I mean, what was it? What did you find? <laughs> well, that's not an easy sure. question to answer. Right. I mean, because these experiences are extremely complicated. They have many layers and layers to them. And it takes years, literally, to, I mean, you understand them when you have them, but it takes years to really unpack the deeper themes and the correlations that emerge over this course of time. Um, how to, where to, what did I learn? Hmm. Was there something that, you know, sparked uh, some sort of realization for you as far as why we're here, you know, what our purpose is, our connection to this reality, what happens when we die. I mean, what was, what was the lesson? Yeah. Do you think? Yes. To all of those things. You basically, I mean, it's, this is one of those things where, I mean, I'm a professor and I like to do things in an organized fashion. And that means starting in the beginning and laying it down phase by phase by phase. If I jump into the end stages or the later stages without covering the earlier stages, it'll sound very ungrounded. It'll sound very, you know, druggy, you know, psychedelic kind of conversation. And that wasn't the nature of my experience. And so I'm kind of hesitant to sort of get to the conclusions too fast. Okay. But basically, methodologically, here's how I understand it. When you go into these hyperstates, if you were willing to confront honestly, even courageously, whatever emerges, you'll go through a series of death and rebirth processes. As I have looked back over all of my accessions over the, over the 20 years that I did them, I basically identified five layers or five cycles of the death rebirth process that took me into different levels of consciousness. The first layer is the death of self, where you basically go through ego death and you go through the death of your time space identity, the identity that we all walk around in, the identity that, would, that basically emerges from birth to death. After that, I entered into a level where the dynamics were all larger than private self. The dynamics were the dynamics of the collective mind. Uh, I entered into a domain that I call the ocean of suffering, uh, entered into an experience, a, a year's worth of experiences where I s experienced my entire life from start to finish, beginning to end as a complete now. All past, present, and future collapsed into a now. I went from there into a series of uh, deep, systematic kind of instruction. I was given a course in cosmology 101. Okay. I, 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 you can't control these experiences. I mean, I could set my intentions, but when you're working with doses this high, it's impossible to control these experiences. The best thing to do is completely surrender, let it take you wherever it wants to take you. And where it will take you is into these deeper and deeper levels where you have to allow yourself to surrender over and over again and eventually to go through the series of death and rebirth processes. So after death of self, two years of work at the collective mind, another two years working at what I called archetypal mind, the greater real of archetypal reality. Okay. Beyond that, um, the level of causal oneness where you enter into a, a completely different experiential reality where all the dualities that we conventionally recognize as part of time and space are dissolved. And then after that, the last five years of my work, I entered into a domain that I call the diamond luminosity uh, work. This is what Buddhism calls Dharmakaya, the clear light of absolute reality, an extraordinarily subtle, subtle, refined, clear, clear dimensions of consciousness. In the process of going through all of these levels, um, the sessions gave me many, many experiences of the, 
many experiences when I, I hesitate to use language of the divine because the language of God or the divine has so many culturally imported limitations that I understand I'm not comfortable with. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is the closest we have in our culture to really speak about these things. I talk about uh, the creative intelligence of the universe. One is, I mean, you're basically taken deep into, dissolved into the intelligence of the universe. So naturally, you have, I had many sessions, many teachings around what we're here for, what's going on, what is our relationship to the universe. And very importantly, Lots of experiences having to do with human evolution and particularly the phase of evolutionary challenge that humanity is facing right here, right now. What is happening in our time in history? This came to be one of the most consistent and dominant and recurring themes of the book. And there's a chapter in the book called The Birth of the Future Human. Um, So lots and lots of levels. Um, what happens to us when we die? Certainly, uh, one can go into the realms of what the Tibetan tradition, Buddhism tradition would call the bardo dimensions. Mm-hmm. You go when you die, and you can also, if you work really hard and consistently, go into what the Buddhists called extra samsaric reality, or reality beyond all the cycles of reincarnation, all the cycles of existence going into that reality that lies, well, beyond the incarnated domains. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of insights that emerged in this work. And what I've done in this book is I simply have taken the reader in as efficiently as I can, starting in the beginning of the work, breaking it down chapter by chapter, year by year, where I went, what happened, what, what emerged. And I really... Well, I just lay it out like that. It's as transparently as I can. I mean, it it sounds phenomenal, right? I mean, and you seem to have the language very clear, which which I find incredibly important when discussing these types of experiences. It seems like you're very mm-hmm. cautious with your verbiage, which I respect very much. Um, you know, what I'm curious about is to know how you worked the integration aspect of it. You talk about something called psychic inflation in the book i mean how did you maintain because it is important to have this sort of critical discernment that you you used and i think it would encourage others to when they're in these experiences to also have that as well because sometimes i hear about people that experience a sort of depersonalization when they experience Mm -hmm. something so transcendent so profound it's difficult Mm -hmm. to integrate it's difficult to come back and mm-hmm. and apply that in a practical way to your understanding of of life, of reality. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I think integration is it is in a topic that's being given more attention now. I don't think it's been given nearly enough attention. Um, there is an anthology coming out in England uh, later this year, twenty twenty, uh, devoted specifically just to integration. Um, See, first, first the, the most important danger of working in these states is psychic inflation. We can have this experience. We can have dramatic experiences, extraordinarily deep experiences. And we can think sometimes that by having these experiences, we become a deep person. But that's really a fool's delusion. You have to really, really keep yourself grounded. You, you go into these states for a few hours you come back, you write them down, then you get back to your nine to five job, you get back to your children, you get back to your world responsibilities, and you first you remember your experiences, and then you think about them, and you try to understand them, and you put into practice, because you put into practice the teachings and the values that you were given and you were shown. Um, To me, uh, the two critical features for using these uh, states of consciousness in a productive way that leads to deep transformation is one, courage, willingness to confront the hard experiences that rise in these experiences, confronting the shadow and more and more than that. Hmm. And secondly, grounding, really, really grounding. And that means 
grounding them in other sets of spiritual practices, grounding them in a daily meditation practice, grounding them in uh, care for the body. And that's really important because usually we describe these states of, as states of consciousness, but they are also states of body. They have profound effects on your body, both your physical system and your subtle energy system. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important to take care of your body, take care of your diet, to take care of your lifestyle. Because if these states are opening you into increasingly deep states of oneness, and if your lifestyle is violating oneness, you know, if it's not a lifestyle of compassion, if it's not a lifestyle of service, then you're, you're living in one way in your daily life and in your sessions, you're going into a different way. And, you know, you're either going to neutralize your sessions by your daily life or you're going to kind of tear yourself apart and become as a kind of spiritual schizophrenia that can sometimes result. So mm -hmm. really staying very, very grounded in the world. And to me, this was really strongly from two things for me, my teaching, because wherever I was on Saturday, on Monday, I was back in my classroom doing my teaching. And the second thing was my family, my, uh, my marriage and my children, really, really keeping me grounded. I mean, were there certain protocols that you use for grounding specifically? I mean, uh, was there, you know, uh, a set sort of amount of things that you did every day after your sessions? What, I mean, how did you ground yourself better other than just kind of a cursory look at, you know, maintaining your relationships and, and, and accountability to yourself? How did you like, were there some practical things that you did as far as grounding? Well, once again, because I, because of what I do for a living, I knew a fair amount about shamanism. I knew about um, mystical, spiritual traditions. So I understood the practices that come out of that tradition. I had a, a good grounding in Western religious thought, and I did a lot of teaching in Eastern religious thought. So I, I had that background to draw upon. But basically, you know, it's not that dissimilar for and what happens if you go on a two week retreat, a, you know, meditation retreat, you're with the teacher and you go out in the woods, or, you know, you're in a retreat center for two weeks, you, you move into a state of consciousness. And then when you come back, it's often grinding to come back and engage traffic jams and, you know, mm -hmm. the regular physical world. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing that happens in a LSD session. It's just that you get into it deeper and faster and you come back faster. But the basic process of holding still, absorbing these experiences, taking them deeply into your mind and into your body, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of shared by all spiritual practices. So practically, uh, I think that the deeper you want to go in non-ordinary states of consciousness using psychedelics, the more important it is to have a daily spiritual practice. And for me, this meant a meditation practice, uh, also a light yoga practice to helping take care of the body. I was helped in this in that my sitter was my wife. She is a clinical psychologist, Carol, and she was a, she is a very serious spiritual practitioner, whom uh, whose practice I respect a great deal. She never did a psychedelic session. Uh, she was a sitter for all of my sessions, mm -hmm. never did one herself because they did not call to her. They, you know, she was basically a meditating person and she found what she needed on the meditation cushion. And uh, she really helped kept, keep me grounded during all these years when I was jumping out and exploring different dimensions of the universe. She really kept reminding me what's important is not what happens on the day of a session. What's important is what you can do the day after a mm -hmm. session. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I right? love that. So that really is, that really calls it, you really have to integrate these experiences into your daily lifestyle. Hmm. And that takes practice. I mean, it takes self clarification, critical self examination. It takes, uh, there's a social dimension, a moral dimension of, of, of compassion and equality. Uh, you know, these, but these are traditionally recognized in all traditional spiritual practices. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, and it's essentially the same. 
I think it's so important because when you're unraveling the aspects of the psyche in this way, it can be very dangerous. I mean, as you said that, you know, there was never a time where you kind of, you dosed and then hung out with friends. There was never a time where you dosed and went out to a concert. So, you know, for you, it, it was a very deliberate intention to you know, connect with yourself and explore consciousness to, to ask these, these larger questions, but, you know, specifically keep it into, in this controlled environment, controlled setting. Yeah. And in that controlled setting, of course, the most important thing is you have to ask yourself at the beginning of every day, every session, uh, are you ready to die? Are you ready to give it all up? And because you confront, you go through many, many deaths in this process. Uh, you know, you don't die physically, but you go through death processes that are so deep, you think you're dying physically. And then you go through processes where, uh, how to put this, and again, I don't want to jump in too deep, too fast, but you go through processes where the death agonies are not personal. The death agonies really are species-wide. And you go through processes when you're moving into archetypal reality and then moving out of archetypal reality. You're dealing with orders of magnitude that are really hard to relate to anything on Earth. Well, let's, de so, let's define archetypal hmm? reality. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, archetypal reality, the, the two figures that come to mind most are Plato and Carl Jung in his work on the collective unconscious. And so Plato's idea is that basically there is a reality behind the physical world which informs and organizes the fundamental structures of the physical world. It's, a, it's an order beyond that, beyond physical reality. And Carl Jung, of course, in talking about archetypes and the collective unconscious, he's talking about the way, the idea that there is a collective mind, which is the soup within which our individual mind floats, so that all of our thinking and feeling and, and processing is contextualized within a species mind, within a collective unconscious of the species. Um, when I went into archetypal reality, I, I had experiences on both levels, on both the high levels, kind of a, a quasi-platonic level where I encountered beings of such magnitude, I could not wrap my mind around them. I mean, it's just vast beings that I knew were the beings responsible for uh, creating space-time, and for in, sort of infusing or growing the order that's emerging in space-time. But they were so vast and, and in such a different order of reality okay. that I, I could not give them firm description. I describe what I, what I experienced in the book, but they don't lend themselves. And I, I describe this as a quasi-Platonic sense because the archetypes that I experienced were not Plato's eternal ideas in the minds of an unchanging infinite consciousness. My experience was that the archetypes, these deep, deep archetypes were living structures. They were living entities. They were, they were, I, I hesitate to call them entities because they're like galaxy size. I mean, they're vast mm -hmm. dimensions, um, but they're living, they're dynamic. They change very slowly relative to us inside mm -hmm. time and space, but they still change. They evolve, they grow. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, when I went into a sort of a lower level of archetypal reality, kind of the collective unconscious of humanity, the more quasi Jungian level, as I didn't experience archetypes the way Jung describes it, but I experienced over and over again the mind of the human species as a living, integrated whole. And I had many experiences where I experienced all of our individual minds as nodes, as fractal nodes within the larger landscape of consciousness. And I was shown how our individual consciousness interacts in complex ways with this larger uh, species mind. Hmm. Right? Hmm. Now, when you, here's another little, just a footnote or in a way, 
every level deeper into a deeper level of consciousness is a step into a higher level of energy. So when you shift from one level of consciousness into a deeper level of consciousness, you have to learn how to manage a much, much higher level of energy. And so every time you go into a deeper level, and you know, I'm, I'm just describing five or six different levels, mm-hmm. you go through intense purification processes. Uh, otherwise, if you go into these levels and you're not acclimated, you haven't done your homework and you haven't been able to acclimate your energy to this very, very, very intense energy levels, then your experiences there will be fragmented. They'll be incoherent. You won't be, they won't make as much sense to you and you won't be able to bring them back clearly. But if you go back to these levels again and again and again, and you submit to the purification processes and the death rebirth processes, then you basically acclimate so that when you go into these states, you learn how to stay conscious in levels of consciousness that previously just swallowed you whole. Okay. Wow. And if you do it in a consistent fashion, you then break through into deeper and deeper levels. But every time you break through, you have to go through more purification processes, more death rebirth processes, just in order to stay clear, to, to establish clarity mm-hmm. at these levels. Okay, so you know, I'm really enjoying everything that you're saying, Chris. So you know, I wanna, I wanna mm-hmm. inject a little bit of my own personal experience. I, you know, I, I've only yeah. had a handful of LSD sessions, but ayahuasca for me is a big part of my life. I take it in a highly controlled setting with mm-hmm. instructed shamans, and the the state in which you're describing, and I do my best to, um, you know, regard it in as as skeptically as I can and as critically mm-hmm. as I can. And mm-hmm. I've definitely had that experience of encountering an intelligence that I can't explain or I, I mean, it, and it's dif- very difficult to understand kind of what it's trying to show me. But when, when I look at, at it in the perspective that you just mentioned, that it's a purification protocol, that it's, it's a, it's a refining of your yourself, of your own consciousness to bring you to a point in which you can sort of understand the larger reality. That fits into a puzzle piece for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Ayahuasca is a beautiful medicine, an extraordinary medicine. If I were starting this whole sequence over again, first of all, I would not do it the way I did it. I would not work so consistently in a sustained fashion in high-dose LSD sessions. I just wouldn't do it. I'd do it differently. I'd balance low and high-dose sessions. I'd also balance LSD with ayahuasca sessions and psilocybin sessions because psilocybin and ayahuasca are more kind of body-grounded psychedelic experiences. LSD tends to be a, a high ceiling it tends to push the high cosmological ceiling and so balancing those i think give you overall a better trajectory in your experiences but ayahuasca is an extraordinary teacher and you know people who do ayahuasca sessions seriously conscientiously you don't have to be convinced that there is an intelligence communicating to you in these sessions because it's just so clearly that you, you engage levels of intelligence that know you, that look at you, that see you, and that help you unearth those things which are holding you back and showing you truths of existence that lie outside your normal state of consciousness. But once you see them, then things begin to make sense to you, make more sense, and you begin to understand what some of the great spiritual teachers have been saying and and the great saints of our different traditions have been saying for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. It's a living intelligence. You know, that's really, that's why, I mean, our universe, we now have an approximate idea of just how vast our universe is. Okay. So let's just temporarily imagine that the universe, The universe has a mind, that there is a mind of the universe. And then imagine if you were going to become one with that mind. Do you really want to do that? 
I mean, that's an extraordinarily, I mean, imagine being one with every life form just on our planet, right. let alone our galaxy. It's just vast, vast, huge energy dimensions here. And so what these substances do is open us up and allow these larger layers of mind with beings that are part of that, allow them into our awareness and begin to interact with them, to have a communion with them, to have a conversation with them, to have an interaction with them. Uh, and if we do this in a sustained fashion, if we do it a little at a certain level, then we have a little bit of a communion. It can teach us some very important things about ourselves and about, you know, it can give us an understanding of what happens to us when we die. But if we go deeper and go deeper and go deeper, we engage this consciousness, these, this infinite consciousness at deeper and deeper levels mm -hmm. until eventually, you know, all form is left behind. One moves into domains of what traditionally call the primal void or formlessness and then into the domain of light, this absolute crystalline, clear light. I have so many questions. Okay, so Chris, yeah. we're running out of time. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I want to know, Chris, it, it, let's, many of the people that are going to be listening to this show, I know already that, you know, perhaps they're not going to have access to LSD or ayahuasca or any of these compounds. Mm -hmm. You know, is it possible yeah. to reach these states through meditation, through inner work? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, the cosmology that emerges, I think, on this work is not a new cosmology. It's the same cosmology we see emerging in the very deepest, and, and of course, there are many levels of mystical tradition, but in the very deepest, the highest levels of teaching, the cosmology that emerges in psychedelic states is the same cosmology. These are. This is simply an amplifier of consciousness. So it's consciousness that does the work. It's not that psychedelics are giving you experiences. Psychedelics amplify your consciousness. So naturally, anything that you experience in that state will find corollaries to experiences that emerge with just meditative experiences. Having said that... Uh, these experiences can become so deep and so profound. I mean, you don't usually transcend time when you're, even if you have a regular and consistent meditation pra practice, and you don't transcend time to go into the future, into future time. And you don't necessarily go back to the beginning before the Big Bang to experience the context out of which the Big Bang emerged. I mean, so on the one hand, yes, you can experience these things with just meditation, absolutely. On the other hand, the, some of these experiences are so radical that they only show up in the very, very most subtle spiritual traditions where they become comfortable with the things that I'm saying, talking about experiencing future time so on and so forth. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. So you know, I want to move back into gear of, of where we were going with, with uh, where yeah. you stopped. Uh, Diamond luminosity. Right, let's address that. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is a, a part of your book that you, you talk about, and I'm very curious to sort of hear your, your firsthand account of you know, what is diamond luminosity? How did yeah. you engage this? How did you get to this point? Would you call it the, the final point? Would you call it reaching this state of oneness with source or? Yeah. Oneness came earlier than diamond luminosity. Um, okay. This is, this is, you know, hard to put this in short, succinct form. When I did this work, I was, I was 15 years in the work. First, let me mention, I did four years of the work. I stopped for six years for reasons that are in the book. And then I resumed and did a very intense 10 years. So even though it spread over 20 years, it was actually 14 years of intense work. Okay. Um, so I'm about halfway through the second, that 10 year period. And I had you know, gone through ego death, I'd gone through the ocean of suffering, done a lot of work at the collective level, I had gone through archetypal reality, and then I went, came into a year of just 
jaw-dropping, extraordinary spiritual experiences of shunyata, of emptiness, the oneness of existence, primordial void, a variety of experiences that I talk about in a, in a book called The Benediction of Blessings. Okay. By the time I was done with that, I, I felt absolutely and completely existentially satisfied. You know, there was work that I had been asked to do on behalf of others, and I had done it voluntarily. And the universe had rewarded me with just extraordinary blessings of experience. I felt completely content, but there was still five years of work uh, to go. When you go through this series of death rebirth experiences, many people experience it. When they come through a death rebirth experience, they encounter light. It's very common that one experiences different orders of light. Mm -hmm. And this happened for me too. There were uh, many experiences of light through those years that I talked about. What happened after the experiences of oneness, the permutations of oneness and the primal void, I went through yet another series of death rebirth experiences, which brought me into uh, a quality of consciousness that was beyond individual consciousness, beyond the species mind, beyond even um, oneness consciousness. It was basically to be a, a hyper, hyper clear, incredibly, it was light, but, but a particular quality of light. When I use the word diamond luminosity, I'm not using simply a, a colorful metaphor to mm. describe the light. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to describe a particular quality of light, hyper, hyper clear. It's just the Buddhist to write, to touch it once undoes thousands of years of wandering lost in samsara. You know, it's just so clear, so pure. Um, and in the last five years of my work, over 26 sessions, I made contact with this diamond luminosity four times and only four times. All right. So for me, there were sessions 45, 50, 60 and 66, very specific days in between those four times tremendous kind of purification, tremendous detoxification in order to be able to come back into this territory. This, uh, the slight, how to describe it. Once I touched it in the 45th session, then it became the sole agenda of my work to return to it. Mm -hmm. There was nothing that I had touched in any of the other levels of consciousness interested me at all compared to returning to this light. Uh, I think it's very similar to the light that some people, when they have near-death experiences, when they enter the light, it's something like that. It's on the order of that kind of experience. It's, in many ways, contentless. In lower levels of consciousness, I had many experiences of being taken on a tour of the universe and being shown this and being shown that, how this works and that works. But when you move into the diamond luminosity, or again, what Buddhism calls uh, Dharmakaya, the domain of Dharmakaya, it's, it's absolutely contentless. It's not, about, uh, it's not about content. It's not about things. It's not about the dynamics. It's, it's the quality of consciousness itself. It's, it's the matrix within which time and space emerges. It's the light that infuses all time space reality and receives all time space reality at the end of our lifetime. Okay. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's such a profound state of being. And, you know, like I said, I've said many times, I, I truly sincerely appreciate um, the way in which you're explaining it. And um, it, it really does sound you know, that it was resounding for you and changed you, you know, forever. Was there, you know, was there something that you felt that you left behind or that you should have done? Because I know there was a point that you decided to stop. And yeah. I'm wondering, you know, what pushed you up against that decision to, to stop? Yeah. And if there was a sort of catalyst. Yeah. 
Well, I stopped for two reasons. As I explained in the book, I stopped because of pain and because of heartache. The pain was um, when you move into the states of consciousness this large and this intense, it activates very, very powerful waves of energy that move through your body. And my subtle energy system, you know, what the Indians call prana and the, the Chinese would call chi, mm -hmm. my subtle energy system basically was so hyper-stimulated, was so hyper-aroused that even though I had done lots and lots of spiritual practice specifically to work with my subtle energy system, I was basically plunging myself into the furnace of creation so many times and so deeply that my subtle energy system was having trouble managing the flows of energy. I mean, I could manage it all fine on a day-to-day, month-to-month basis, but cumulatively I was in a state of chronic uncomfortableness. I was uncomfortable in my body. Hmm. Uh, and I knew that it was time for me to stop, to let my body cool down, to, to really focus on integrating experiences that I had had rather than plunging into still deeper experiences. Remind me to come back to it's an infinite progression. I just remembering I wanted to say this. It's it you don't get to an end point. It's an infinite progression. But <clears throat> the second reason I stopped and the primary reason was heartache. Basically, when you when I'll just keep it personal, going into such hyper clear, hyper transcendent states where you were dissolved into light, you are light, you are dissolved into the crystalline body of the divine. Coming back into time and space became just too painful for me. It became, I was basically, um, it became too painful for me to keep going back and forth and back and forth. Uh, I eventually decided, I realized it was time for me to stop. It was time for me to finish digesting everything that I had, had been given. Uh, and I, I just couldn't take the heartache of going into the luminosity anymore. Because you so knew I that made, you were leaving? or? Well, no, I, I mean, I, I knew I was leaving. Yeah, at the end, I mean, at the very end, I knew I was leaving. I knew that I would not that there would be no time in the rest of my life when I would ever be this absorbed so intimately into the universe. Because I could not take a massive dose of LSD and get into that space today. It takes years and years of sustained work to build up the momentum, to build up the energy to crack into these states of consciousness. So that I knew when I was leaving, I knew I was leaving for the rest of my life. Hmm. Uh, and I basically made a deal with the universe to never bring me back until I can stay. And that's when I really, that's when my sessions really did end. Wow. Now, the thing about it open-ended, when I was deep in the diamond, diamond luminosity work, I was halfway through that five-year period, and I got as deep into the luminosity as I ever went. It was the 50th session. So I was in an extremely clear, really, really special place. And right when I was in it, my visual field pivoted 90 degrees, and I saw reality far, far in the distance. And the light of that reality hit me, and it hit me like a lightning bolt, and it just shattered me. It just completely transfixed me. And so I called it the absolute light, just to give it a name, but I knew that there was a reality as far beyond the diamond luminosity as the diamond luminosity was beyond space-time. And that's when I came to understand that it's an infinite progression, because like many people, I had assumed that there was an end to this journey. You become one with God or you enter into the primal metacosmic void. And I had experienced oneness with God, and I learned that there were many degrees and levels and permutations of oneness. And I experienced, had experienced the void, and I learned that there were even permutations of the void. But I always assumed 
that there was an end point. You would reach a point and it would be absolutely you had reached your destination. Right. Now, for me personally, the diamond luminosity was my end point. It was my destination. It filled as many experiences had been with an absolute sense of homecoming, homecoming. And just when I was at this point, the universe showed me that there are dimensions of reality beyond any that I would be able to touch in this lifetime, even using this powerful method. And that's when I understood it's an infinite progression. You don't get to an end point. And that's one of the reasons why I would be gentler with myself if I were doing it again and why I would recommend that other people be gentler with themselves. Because the goal, I think, is not to get to some state of being or some state of consciousness, which the which is an end point. The goal, I think, is to open us to the universe and to let as much of the energy of the creative intelligence of the universe into our being, to purify ourselves and to engage it and to enter into dialogue with it. And then basically, uh, let nature take its course and let us grow. I'm more patient with a slower transformational process than I than I was when I was a young man. Chris, I mean, I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this this conversation. I'm quite surprised by the preciseness in your verbiage and and the way that you're you're discussing and talking about this. If you could, you know, somehow bring this all together and perhaps include a warning for explorers, people who are, I mean, we've seen this surgence, resurgence in uh, the usage of psychedelics. Many people use them uh, without caution. You know, they're, they're doing them at concerts. And it, so, you know, if people are going to do them, you know, and, and they're aiming for connected states such as the ones that you describe, you know, maybe a warning for those explorers and those travelers. And then, if you could wrap this together in in a bow tie, because <laughs> even though your journey didn't have, you know, a, a yeah. specific endpoint, this conversation does have an endpoint. So, yeah, yes, yes. The more uh, experience I've collected using psychedelics, the more cautions I am, and the more uh, uncomfortable I am with people taking psychedelics in less than controlled circumstances. Now. Many people have had very deep life-changing experiences tripping, and I, I wouldn't want to – I don't mean to criticize that. But when you are taking a substance that has the potential to open up all the sluice gates in your mind and open up into these deep, deep levels of reality, if you do this in a complicated or uh, a socially complicated or sens- sensational complicated, sensation complicated setting – It can be really complicated and you you can get over your head quickly and you can, um, well, you can get over your head. You can really have experiences that can leave you traumatized. Um, And in order to go where I went, you have to be willing to enter into unthinkable places, but you also have to see all of your experiences all the way through to the very end. If you stop, Midway, if you enter into some of the intense purification or or threatening death of self spaces and you try to stop that, then it's like you leave the spring coiled in your consciousness that's just always trying to to finish the job. So I really encourage, be very, very cautious. I would hate for anyone to take my book and, and use it as a guidebook to try to have similar experiences and injure themselves. It would just be terrible. And it is possible to injure yourself using these amplifiers. I recommend extreme caution um, and very to note, get the literature, do your research. There's lots of good literature out there. Lots of good books on methodology. There's more coming out uh, every year. And if there were a takeaway, If there were one thing I wish that I could lift from people's lives, it would be the fear of death. Hmm. I mean, to me, not only am I not afraid of dying, I'm honestly and truly looking forward to it. I'm not looking forward to the dying itself, but I'm looking forward to being dead. Because my experience of the universe, of the intelligence of the universe, and the compassion of the universe, and the wisdom of the universe is such that I have a sense that I have 
I have touched where I'm going when I die. And it's a magnificent reality, layers and layers of reality. And to be afraid of death is to have your, the whole world upside down. Time space is where the hard work is done. Time space is where we're here and we're working and we're trying to regain our consciousness. And there's lots of important work to do here. Death is like graduation. Death is like homecoming. Death is return to source and essence. Now, if you die before you die, you know, there's a monk who said, those who die before they die do not die when they die. It is possible to enter into the reality that one enters into after you die, but to enter into that while your body is physically alive. That is, I think, classically, I wouldn't say that's what the enlightenment experience is, but that's we're going in that direction, Mm -hmm. where you can stand in the physical world, be completely transparent to spiritual reality, and live consciously in the physical world and in spiritual reality at the same time. And there are many, many permutations of that kind of experience. But to be apt to be afraid of death, that's such a heartache uh, because that's, that's to not understand how the universe works and how it's organized. That's why my first book of the ones you mentioned, my first one was a book on reincarnation because I think we have a great deal of empirical evidence that reincarnation is simply true. And if you don't understand reincarnation, then you don't understand your relationship to the universe. I love it, Chris. This was such a phenomenal conversation. If if you could just remind me how I say your last name and also where people can go, your website, URL, the, yeah. the book. Uh, my last name is pronounced Beige. Uh, there... Uh, People can contact me at this email address, C.M. Beige, my initials in Beige, at ysu.edu. But within a month, around the time the book comes out, around Thanksgiving, I'll have a a website complete, and it will be chrisbeige.com. And that will be the easiest way to reach me. Okay. Wow, guys, that's going to do it for us here at HXP. What a phenomenal conversation. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. My guest, Dr. Christopher uh, Bache, and the book is called LSD and the Mind of the Universe. And I, I guess you guys have his email address for those of you that had questions in the chat that I didn't get to. I apologize. If you're listening to this on YouTube, or if you're listening to this on the podcast version, please make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube as well so you can catch the live shows. Uh, if you're, if you're as well, if you're listening to this on the podcast version, please get over to iTunes, subscribe, leave us a review. Uh, one of the main things that I hear is that people just haven't discovered the show yet. So one of the biggest compliments you can give us is just sharing what we do with your friends and family. Thank you guys so much for listening. I really, really appreciate your presence. We will be back next week.